turkey day. We all love a good helping of stuffing and cranberry sauce to go along with our slices of turkey, not to mention the pumpkin and pecan pie desserts. For the families on this list, Thanksgiving changed forever when their loved ones strangely disappeared on the holiday that's supposed to bring people together. Here are five mysterious Thanksgiving Day disappearances. Number five, the disturbing case of Kelsey Barrett. On the chilly morning of November 22nd of 2018 in the city of Woodland Park, Colorado, 29-year-old Kelsey Barrett, a young mother, was seen for the last time. As the days of searching for her dragged on and Kelsey remained missing, a trail of evidence began to surface, revealing a twisted tale of love, deceit, and possibly murder. The primary suspect is Patrick Frazy, Barrett's fiance, who within just a few weeks of her disappearance, was arrested and charged with her murder. In a shocking turn of events, testimonies during a preliminary hearing in Cripple Creek exposed the extent of Frazee's alleged involvement. It was said that on that fateful Thanksgiving day, Frazee wrapped a sweater around Barrett's head and brutally struck her with a baseball bat, all while their one-year-old child was in the other room playing. Later, he would go on to burn her body in a water trough on his property in an attempt to cover his tracks. A significant testimony came from Idaho nurse Crystal Kenny, who claimed to be in an intimate relationship with Frazee in early 2018. And Kenny's narrative painted a dark picture. The weapon that Patrick used, the killing, and the attempts to dispose of the body. Ultimately, she pleaded guilty to tampering with evidence. What adds an eerie dimension to this case is Frazee's attempt to involve Kenny in the disposal of Barrett's body, revealing a chilling indifference to his actions. Frazee allegedly stored the body in a black tote bag and then shoved it into a large haystack. After that, he attended a Thanksgiving dinner like everything was cool, and later disposed of the remains by burying them and then leaving them in a river or trash dump. Kenny's account revealed that this wasn't Frazee's first attempt either at committing the crime of murder. Three prior incidents were orchestrated but never executed, and poisoning Barrett's coffee being the first. The crime scene, as described by Kenny, was gruesome. She painted a vivid picture of her arriving at Barrett's residence to find the place covered in blood. Despite the horrific scene, Kenny spent hours cleaning, erasing, or at least trying to, any trace of the brutal act that had taken place there. Frazee's alleged motive, as suggested by the Barrett family, was even more unsettling, a custody battle. They believe Frazee's intention was to gain full custody of their daughter, which Kelsey had refused. The details and events following Barrett's disappearance were also strange, which allowed authorities to hone in on Patrick. Her cell phone, for example, oddly was pinged near Gooding, Idaho, about 800 miles away from where she lived. She didn't know anyone up in that area, so why would she be there? Furthermore, a call from Barrett's concerned mother to Frazee yielded a web of lies. He had spun a tale of their breakup on Thanksgiving and agreed joint custody of their child, a narrative that the mom knew wasn't likely as her daughter did not trust the father of her child. As the investigation proceeded, Frazee faced an increasing list of charges, including two counts of first-degree murder based on different theories. Although Kelsey's body was never found, based on the testimony and other evidence, Frazee was found guilty of the crime of murder and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Number four the mysterious disappearance of Paul Knockle. In 1990, the small town of Dubuque, Iowa, was not accustomed to the flurry of police activity that suddenly descended upon 2105 Washington Street on the evening of November 26th. That home belonged to Paul Knockle, a 53-year-old man who had seemingly vanished into thin air. Concerned relatives, along with authorities, entered Knuckles' residence, only to find alarming signs. 
His wallet laid untouched on the kitchen table. The sneakers he wore daily were in their usual spot and even his watch remained. But both Paul and his car, a 1981 Red Mercury Zephyr, was nowhere in sight. November 12th was the last time he had talked to a family member. The following day, a cousin says he saw Paul's car parked along Route 151, just across the Wisconsin border. When Paul didn't show up for Thanksgiving dinner with everyone, they started to connect the dots that Paul was actually missing. It didn't make much sense. Why would Paul leave behind everyday items, especially if he were planning to drive? His brother Noel weighed in. He definitely knew something was happening. We didn't even know what he had on for shoes when he left, but apparently he knew something bad was coming down. Knuckle wasn't the type to have any enemies. Described as a simple, dedicated man with a learning disability, he went to work daily, rarely indulging in social activities. He wasn't embroiled in any shady affairs, nor did he have substance abuse issues. He was a lifelong bachelor with no kids who just minded his own business. Dubuque Police Lieutenant Scott Baxter remarked, Everybody we talked to, our investigation, there's nothing to indicate this individual led a seedy lifestyle. Yet something or someone prompted him to get in his car very hastily and drive away somewhere without any of his important personal effects, shoes and wallet. The area where the car was last seen was scoured, especially the thick woods nearby, but it was as if Paul and his car had vanished into the ether. Years then turned into decades, with the police chasing countless leads, all leading to dead ends. One prevailing theory, though, was the Mississippi River. Given its strong currents and vast expanse, it was plausible that Paul might have ended up there, whether by accident or foul play. However, Lieutenant Baxter explained the challenges posed by the river. Generally speaking, he said, we usually recover bodies that are disposed of in the river, not all the time. And depending on the circumstances, if the body is contained in a vehicle, that creates another challenge to us. The case grew colder as the years went by, leaving the family to only speculate on what could have happened. And Paul's mysterious disappearance haunted them as they held on to hope for some form of closure. For Paul was more than just a missing person statistic. He was a beloved family member who faced adversities in his life. And then recently, on October 12th of 2023, a shocking discovery. Employees from the Newt Marine Services found a submerged vehicle during dredge operations near the Hawthorne boat ramp along the Mississippi River. And it was the same red 1981 Mercury Zephyr, though no human remains were found. It was undeniably Paul's vehicle. And though this revelation brought some answers, it also raised more questions. Where was Paul? Why was the car submerged? And most importantly, what happened on that fateful night? The Knuckle family remains hopeful that one day they'll get answers that they desperately seek and want to give Paul the respect and closure he deserves. And if someone were the cause of his demise, they would certainly want justice for that. Number three, disappearance of Cynthia Linda Alonzo. In the fall of 2004, Thanksgiving promised a reprieve from the daily hustle for many in Oakland, California. For the family of 48-year-old Cynthia Linda Alonzo, the holiday became a haunting memory. Linda was known for her kind spirit and her close-knit ties with her family. On November 24th of 2004, she and her boyfriend, Eric Mora, were seen leaving West Oakland, headed out for San Francisco. The purpose of their journey was simple and the same as many other people that day. They were headed to Linda's mother's house for a Thanksgiving holiday gathering. It was a yearly tradition for Linda, one she seldom missed, but this year she never made it to her mother's home. When Linda failed to show, the family knew something was wrong. Her sudden and unexplained absence was very out of character. But the days turned into weeks and weeks into months with no sign of her anywhere. 
As the investigation deepened, all fingers pointed to one person, the last person she was known to be with, Eric. While Eric continued to deny any involvement, he also didn't have any answers. The weight of evidence was against him. Despite not having a body, by March of 2012, he was finally convicted of second-degree murder and then sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. However, the road to justice wasn't straightforward. A twist in the tale came in 2016 when a state court annulled Mora's conviction. And the ground for this startling development? The trial judge's decision to prevent Mora from suggesting that someone else could have been responsible for Linda's demise. But then, later that same year, Mora's guilt seemed to weigh heavily upon him. In a shocking turn of events, he just confessed to the heinous act even offering a general location for where he'd concealed Linda's body. Yet even with this confession, investigators came up empty-handed, and the whereabouts of Linda remained an unsolved riddle. A year later, in 2017, Moore found himself once again before the courts. With the confession now on record, he was reconvicted and sentenced to 11 years in state prison. Belinda's tale doesn't end there because on a spring day in May, two years after Moore's retrial, a work crew made a chilling discovery at 7th and Maritime Streets. Beneath the ground, wrapped meticulously in tarps, was a body, and forensics confirmed what many had suspected for years. It was Linda. Danielle London, the deputy district attorney, remarked on the closure of this long and harrowing chapter, it was a long road to get here, and the family stuck with us along the way. We are relieved to have finally found Linda so the family can have a proper burial. The sentiment was clear. Linda's memory would always live on, and now, with the discovery of her remains, we could finally be laid to rest. Number 2. The Unsolved Case of Beth Barr In the tight-knit community of Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania, November 23, 1977, started just like any other day. But by its end, it would become a date etched in the collective memory of the town, marking the beginning of an unsolved mystery that would span over decades. Beth Barr, a six-year-old girl with an infectious smile, was looking forward to the Thanksgiving holiday. Her school had scheduled an early dismissal. She would usually walk home with a friend, but on this fateful day, her friend's mother picked her up, and so Beth began her short journey home alone. It was a walk she would never complete. A vigilant elderly neighbor would later recount that she saw the young girl talking to a man in a blue sedan not far from her home. The car, distinctive with its red and white license plates, would become a focal point in the investigation as authorities believed the man in that vehicle abducted Beth. The shocking realization of Beth's disappearance sent ripples of fear and disbelief throughout the community. Her father, a respected officer on the Wilkinsburg police force, was at a loss. Surely if anybody could find the girl, it would be the dad who was a cop, but it wasn't that easy. He joined forces with colleagues, friends, and volunteers to scour the area, hoping to find any trace of his daughter or any clue, but there was nothing. Among those drawn into the whirlwind was Zandy Dudyak, a rookie reporter who had only been working for the Wilkinsburg Gazette for five months. She hoped, like everyone else, that Beth would be found safe and sound. However, the case left an indelible mark on Dudyak, forever changing her perspective on parenting. She reflected, the fact that this could happen to a child really changed the way I parented. I had eyes everywhere after that when I was out with my kids. And many parents in the community felt the exact same way, making sure to hug their children a little more often and tell them that they love them more than they ever had before. Nearly 16 months after Beth's disappearance, a man walking his dog near a cemetery in Monroeville, which is about 15 minutes from Wilkinsburg, came across something he'd never expect when his dog kept sniffing and pawing at the ground. It was a shallow grave, and buried there were the remains of Bethlehem Barr. 
Dr. Cyril Wett, the Allegheny County coroner at the time, noted that the condition of the body made it challenging to ascertain details. Still though, the autopsy revealed the brutal nature of her death, multiple stab wounds to her chest. Throughout the investigation, there were leads, potential suspects, and even an arrest, but no one was ever charged with the murder. One particularly promising clue, the blue sedan, led the police to a rental agency at one point, but that only led to another dead end. The unsolved nature of the case weighed heavily on everyone connected to it, including Robert Payne, then an investigator with the Allegheny County Police. And looking back, Payne believes that some early decisions in the investigation might have cost them precious time, particularly the decision not to call in the county police immediately. The community may have moved forward, but it never truly healed. Even after four and a half decades, the name Beth Barr evokes deep emotions. Many still remember the innocent child whose life was taken too soon. Zandy Dudiak, profoundly affected by the tragedy, dedicated a website to the case, periodically receiving tips and new information. For Donna Barr, Beth's mother, the pain is still raw. Speaking out for the first time in over 40 years, she emphasizes her wish. She never wants anyone to forget her daughter. In a town so tight-knit like Wilkinsburg, it's doubtful anyone ever will. Number 1. Karen Mitchell In 1997, in the beautiful coastal city of Eureka, California, a dark mystery unfolded on Thanksgiving Day that to this day still remains unsolved. 16-year-old Karen Mitchell, an ambitious, bright, and passionate teenager with a fierce love for the environment, vanished without a trace. But like many mysteries, it's not just the event itself that captured the attention of the public, but the eerie set of circumstances surrounding it. Born into a loving family, Karen faced the challenges of her parents' divorce early on when she was just a baby. Seeking stability and a safer environment for her daughter, her mother Mary made the difficult decision to send Karen to live with her aunt Annie when she was 13, where Annie became her legal guardian in Eureka. The transition seemed to be for the best. While Karen spent holidays and took vacations with her biological parents, she thrived in her new surroundings. Excelling in her studies, she was determined to make a mark in the world of environmental sciences. As Thanksgiving break approached during her junior year of high school, Karen was on the brink of an exciting new chapter. She and her mother spent hours discussing her college plans, and there was a palpable excitement in the air, a sense of anticipation. We were busy girls, Mary fondly recalled of their morning conversations. During her holiday break on November 25th that year, Karen visited her aunt at her shoe store that was located in the bustling Bayshore Mall shopping center. At around 2.45 p.m., she left to walk to her job at a local daycare center, which was only about a mile away. Karen would then last be seen walking towards Sonoma Street. She would never be seen or heard from again after that. As the next couple of hours passed and evening settled in, the disturbing realization set in that Karen never arrived at the daycare center. The bright young girl, who once talked excitedly about college plans, was now officially missing. The clues were scant. A retired police officer's account of a near accident involving a light blue 1977 Ford Granada turned out to be crucial. He described a girl resembling Karen getting into this car, and it was driven by an elderly man. And this guy was Caucasian, possibly 60 to 70 years old. He had a large nose and wore glasses and had a small build, but despite the efforts by law enforcement to track him down, neither the man nor the vehicle could be identified. As the years rolled on, Karen's case saw multiple potential suspects. Wayne Adam Ford, a serial killer, caught the attention of investigators, but he was much too young in terms of who they thought they were looking for. In 1997, Ford was only 36 years old and likely got on the authorities' radar because he was caught in 1998 for the murders of four women that occurred between 97 and 98. 
His hunting grounds were in and around the Eureka area, but ultimately no connections were solidified between him and Karen. Around four months after her disappearance, though, a frail-looking man visited Annie's shoe store on several occasions, and that man was none other than Robert Durst. He was 54 years old at the time, though he looked older than he was, and he's known for a very sketchy past of murdering his first wife, as well as a few others, and he also matched the suspect's sketch. And he was never formally charged with having anything to do with the disappearance of Karen. However, many find it to be a very strange coincidence that he was in the area at the time and as a convicted serial killer. Robert Durst passed away in 2022, perhaps taking with him to the grave the secrets of what happened to the young girl. And today, despite extensive searches, interviews, and a community rallying together, the whereabouts of Karen still remain a mystery. So there were five mysterious Thanksgiving Day disappearances. If you're looking for a creepy thriller movie to watch, you can check out the one that the team from Everytown made entirely for free, either on YouTube or Tubi. Links are down below. It's called An Angry Boy. I wrote and directed it, so please go check it out. Just trust me, you'll see exactly why his rage is well-deserved. Thanks for all your support and for tuning in. Hope you have a great Thanksgiving. I'll see you guys in the next one.